Um, I now want to introduce you to uh, Alison Kyo, um, and um, we've worked together for a long time. Alison studied physiotherapy in UCD and then did a master's in sports and exercise medicine in Trinity. Um, she then came back to do a PhD in UCD and then afterwards started working in the Insight Center. Uh, she worked on a lot of different projects in Insight um, over a number of years related to digital tools um, and their use in innovation in healthcare pathways. Uh, and also in promotion of activity. And she's also very interested, and you'll see from some of the work, and Alison was involved in some of the previous work that we spoke about, that uh, a lot of her work is in uh, involved in the exploration of strategies around marathon running, and she was involved in the Paceman project. Um, Alison has just recently started a new role as a lecturer in healthcare innovation in Trinity. Um, so unfortunately, we, we would be losing her. Um, um, and although she's not involved in running um, and as a sport, um, Alison is an international hockey umpire, so some of you may already be familiar with her. And um, thank you very much for doing this today because you're dashing to the airport immediately for a hockey engagement. Yep. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. It's always a challenge to, to follow off from Barry and his great work, but I'm going to do my best and go through some of the evidence that we have from existing literature within the area of uh, marathon training. Um, if anyone can't hear me as we go through, just raise your hand, shout at me as, as we go. Um, today, I'm just going to go briefly into the, the evidence that we have um, in existence already, some of the challenges that face marathon runners when it comes to training. We'll then go and look at what the evidence and the published literature says, um, what type of studies um, exist in this area, some of the characteristics of them, before looking at what the results of some of them are. So what of the studies that have taken place that have tried to um, produce predict or alter uh, marathon training times or, or marathon times based on training. And then finally, very briefly, look at some of the practical things that we can consider at the moment based on the evidence that we have in existence. So we all know the kind of the fable of marathon running um, has come back from Greek times when the messenger arrived having run 40 kilometers and then drops dead on arrival. But marathon running has obviously um, come leaps and bounds since then. And we all know it in its most recent format um, since the 1896 Olympics. Um, but really, it has exploded in the last couple of decades, particularly since the 70s, where we now have over 5,000 mar marathons happening a year with over 2 million participants happening globally. And this is big business now. We have an awful lot of people that want to do their very best, that don't want to get injured and that want to cross that finish line on time. So how do they train to make sure that all their time and effort and money and commitment pays them dividends? A cursory glance at the internet will show the abundance of information that exists out there. And it can be really confusing, particularly for people who are just starting off with marathon running or their first marathon running. Um, where do they go? YouTube, Instagram, scientific literatures, experts, books, the, the, the amount of possibilities there is endless. Um, and, you know, you don't even have to look at the likes of Strava or Garmin or anything at the moment to see that we also have like experts who have decades worth of experience that can claim that they know how you should best run your marathon. So where does someone start? Um, you know, how do they know which strategy is going to work best for them? And where do they even begin on picking all of this information? Because it's absolutely almost kind of like a, a paradox of choice happening here. And unfortunately, the result at the moment is a lot of people are facing this jigsaw puzzle that they just don't know how to get the pieces together that fit them best. Um, and this, I suppose, is where the science comes in, because what science does is has it has a hypothesis. We have um, a plan or something that we think is going to happen. And so we can then manipulate different variables to test whether our idea is true or not. If we look at experts, they have decades of, um, I suppose, you know, free living experience under their belt. And they have knowledge around period periodization, around physiology. 
But the two things can't be compared. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but we can't definitively state that expert opinion is the same as what uh, scientific um, evidence and hypothesis can show us. So, and that's where I suppose we were looking at the science because there's lots of different studies that exist out there where people have tried to change different pieces of people's training and then have come up with a result as to how effective that was or not. But as a single study, we don't learn an awful lot. But when we collectively put them together and pool them, we can learn an awful lot more. And so that's what we were looking to do with a study that we um, uh, completed a couple of years ago, about 2019 now at this stage. So we did what's called a systematic review. And a systematic review is where we systematically look at all the published scientific research that exists. Um, we extract the information that is relevant to us. So for us, it's looking at people who have run a marathon, who are over the age of 18, and who have reported something to do with their training strategies in the run up to that marathon. And then what we did was we pooled them together to say, what can we learn from this literature as a collective more than we'll learn from looking at them as individual studies? And so what we did was we well, we did our systematic review and we found that we had 85 articles that fit our um, criteria. So that's an immediate flag that despite the popularity of marathons, um, we actually don't have an awful lot of research in the area of training that has been published. Most of the research that has taken place has taken place with male runners, over 75%. Most of it has taken place with recreational runners and most of it has taken place within the U.S., so again, that's a little bit of a flag that we have a biased sample here, that the, the evidence that we have around marathon training sways us towards this cohort of people in particular. So as we're going through, just kind of keep that in mind. In terms of the studies that exist, um, most of the studies, interestingly, only really looked at tweaking one or two variables, whereas we know from our own kind of um, training practices, there's so many different things that we can look at when we um, go to train for a marathon. So the fact that they were only looking at one piece, again, is a little bit of a limitation. But what was also interesting is this, this research spans across five decades, but over 40% of it has actually taken place since 2010. But despite the relative newness of this uh, research, only 5% of the marathon training research at the moment lists GPS as one of its methods. So the majority of research is completely basing its opinions and its um, recommendations off self-report data. OK, somebody saying what they did and how they did it. But what we did was we took out all the information that existed because we needed to understand, well, what is in existence at the moment? And to pool it together and to make a um, reasonably accurate estimate of effectiveness, we had to include or only include training variables that had been reported in 10 studies or more. So effectively, if they're not within 10 studies, we can't really... Um, accurately say how much of a role that they have to play um, in training. So even though there was an awful lot of variables, we actually were only able to look at seven and say, what influence have these seven had on marathon performance um, subsequently? Also, when we kind of look at it, we, we ideally would have liked to have pulled them together. So say if we take uh, average weekly training distance plus longest um, training run, and say, what's the difference between focusing on them versus just looking at uh, the longest training run? We weren't able to do that. And the reason we weren't able to do that is because of that self-report data. When there's a lot of differences in how people report something, it becomes very tricky for us to definitively state this is what happened. OK, so there is, again, a little bit of a limitation there with this. But these are the seven training parameters um, that were uh, listed in 10 or more studies. And interestingly, all of them are, are uh, influential to marathon performance. So we can see there in the brackets at the end, there's the range of what was reported, but that or squared number is the one that's kind of most important for us to look at. The closer that is to one, the more predictive it is subsequently of um, marathon training. So effectively for all of these, we have significant um, changes. It, it, 
in essence, if you increase or improve your performance in each of these seven variables, you will subsequently decrease your marathon performance um, or finish time. OK, so but we can see um, the R squared up at uh, 0.8 there is maximum training distance of one week. Average training, uh, weekly training distance is 0.7. They are more predictive than something like um, our number of sessions a week when it comes to training. But what does this mean for us practically? We were able to kind of work backwards a little bit and particularly focusing on those who want to do, we'll say, a four hour marathon time. We were able to turn around and say that there are certain parameters that they should look at in terms of their training volumes. So if you're a, four, a person that's looking to, to finish in four hours, um, your average weekly training distance should be around 44 kilometers. You should do about four and a half hours of training a week and you should not go over 63 kilometers in one week in your training block. Your pace should be about 97% of your planned marathon um, pacing strategy. And the longest training run, interestingly, should only be about 27 kilometers. Now, this is just for people who are looking to run four hour marathons. There's a lot of people that think that 32 kilometers is what we should look at. But the evidence that is in existence at the moment for four hours would suggest that you don't need to do that, that a 27 kilometer run is the longest thing that you need to do. Now, again, the evidence and the kind of the, the availability of the numbers wasn't there for us to be able to extrapolate this into two hours, two and a half. Uh, we were only able to confidently look at this for four hours, but it's still a kind of an indication of the types of thresholds that we could look at if this research develops further. But probably the biggest thing for us from this um, literature review that we did is the limitations that are in existence at the moment. Despite the popularity of marathon running, we can see that there's not a lot of evidence in existence out there at the moment that has been published. Um, and so this is in a way exciting because there's an awful lot more for us to learn. And there's an awful lot that we can't necessarily be confident in that work like what Barry is doing can can help and that we can look at further. So big cautious point of the day is if someone turns around and tells you, I can definitively give you a training program that will guarantee you a three hour training or a finish time, they can't based on the evidence that we have at the moment. And that's not to dismiss expert opinion, but it is to give a little bit of, a, I suppose, a warning signal that we don't actually definitively know an awful lot um, about this as a topic yet. Um, Similarly, some of our limitations, again, as I've kind of already uh, highlighted, are that, you know, we still need to know an awful lot more about people outside of the US um, and about women runners uh, in particular. Um, I can skip over that one. Uh, we've kind of covered that. So uh, the kind of big takeaway from this study um, is linked to what Barry is doing and also what you'll hear from Kira is the potential for high volumes of data for us to get meaningful insights as to A, what people are doing, but then to learn from what people are doing and plan as to how we can change that in the future. So if we know that the majority of runners are doing X number of kilometers in their training runs, and we want to know the influence of changing that by 10% or whatever, we need to know what they're doing, and then we can start planning it and then start tweaking it further. And some of our studies that we can look to do in the future may be able to benefit from people interacting with the likes of Strava or RunKeeper, or potentially in the future, even pairing with them to start doing studies like this. But at the moment, this is very much an area that is growing and that is potentially very exciting for us to look at. So that was a very quick uh, whistle stop tour for me. I hope I've given you a little bit more time back. But a takeaway from this is that really at the moment, the evidence suggests that there's really only seven key training behaviors that have been shown to be um, effective in terms of marathon finishing time at the moment. So if you tweak those seven variables and you improve your performance in them, you will improve your marathon finish time. But this is absolutely still a growing area. Use the likes of Strava more. That gives us the data to use and that we can learn more of this from and be very cautious if someone promises you a, a definitive finishing time. Thank you. <laughs>